Rahm Emanuel's run for mayor and the state's capital construction plan are in limbo as Illinois courts make some big decisions this week. That's up next on Capital View. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Capital View, the show where we talk about Illinois politics and government. I'm your host, Jamie Dunn, with Illinois Issues Magazine, and with me today is Kevin McDermott, uh, the State House Bureau Chief for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Kevin, thanks for coming. It's Jamie. Bethany Krajellis, the State House Reporter for the Chicago Daily Law Bulletin. Bethany, thanks for being here. Thank you. And Ray Long, the State House Bureau Chief for the Chicago Tribune. Ray, thanks for coming. Good to be here. So this week in Illinois, we've seen a lot of big legal decisions that uh, will have a lot of impact on the future of the state. Uh, the first one I'd like to talk about today has to do with executive appointments. Uh, um, the Senate has gotten into a little bit of a fight with Governor Quinn about whether they have to take up his exec executive appointments that held over from last session. And the Attorney General sided with Quinn on this issue. Ray, can you give us a little background of where this fight emerged from? Sure. Uh, Cullerton's office, Senate President John Cullerton's office, wanted to make it clear and wanted to make a point that they had several appointments that had not been approved. Or as you know, the Senate is supposed to give advice and consent to appointments by the governor. There were several of them. There were dozens, actually. And one of them, for example, was the director of the state police. They were all caught up, they had not been approved, and uh, the office of Cullerton actually sent a letter to the comptroller that said they should not be paid because they have not been approved. Well, that became a little tiff here. It went to Attorney General Lisa Madigan's office, and she sided with Quinn and said, they're still appointed, look at tradition, they've uh, continued to be paid before, and they will be paid this time too. So. That moved on, now they're just gonna have to reappoint them in the new session and see what happens then. And the Senate plans to have hearings pretty soon, like possibly next week when they come back. They're Could be that early, some. yes. But this issue of appointments has, has been contentious off and on for a while now. It seems like Cullerton and uh, House Speaker Michael Madigan are kind of pushing Quinn on the appointments. Any idea as to why this has, has become an issue between Quinn and a Democratic legislature that's kind of calling him out on on, yeah, um, one of the interesting things was that uh, maybe a year or two years ago, uh, House Speaker Michael Madigan had introduced legislation that said, okay, let's wipe out all of the appointments that were done by Blagojevich and I believe at some point Ryan too. So it would have uh, potentially affected hundreds of people. So Quinn did not want to go that far and then that bill actually passed the House and then it uh, got through a Senate Executive Committee but never really moved any further. There's a lot of people that think that that's, it's almost too much of a, a sweep and it could throw things out of kilter, but really um, it's one of those things where uh, a lot of people think that some of the folks that were put in by Ryan and Blagojevich uh, just should not be there anymore. Well, it seems like Monken is kind of the hot potato in this issue mm -hmm. because... A little controversy. Yeah. Well, because of youth and inexperience, this is the state police um, director that, that Ray was talking about. It, it, he's, I, he's, I think, the only one that, that, I mean, whenever we talk about this controversy, he's really the only one in which the, the appointee per se is, the, is, is really the issue. I know that in general terms, holdovers from the, the Bogoyevich administration have been something of an issue, but you do get the feeling that this also has a lot to do with kind of a turf battle between the legislative and executive branches. Right, right. I do believe that uh, w what's going on there partly is, w as Kevin was saying, and I just want to underscore it, that he, uh, Munkin didn't have police experience. He had been in uh, Iraq as a commander of uh, many troops. I don't know the exact terminology off the top of my head. But he had been in charge of many troops in, in uh, Iraq, as I recall, and he uh, looked like a good qualified veteran to Pat Quinn, and therefore he, Quinn went ahead and, and put him in charge of the state police. It raised all kinds of uh, questions with the, uh, the senators who have to 
to confirm him, and he never got confirmed. A lot of them have asked him questions. How is he learning? What kind of training has he gone through? Has he done enough to really be in charge or to, to take that job and for them to, to confirm him? But that uh, issue is now going to be thrown into the new General Assembly. We'll see how it turns out. Um, the other big uh, legal issue that came up this week was uh, an appellate court ruling on Rahm Emanuel's eligibility to run for mayor of Chicago. He's leading all the polls right now. He, he looked like probably far and away the top candidate at this point. And an appellate court ruled that he's actually not eligible because they're saying that he didn't meet the eligibility requirement of residency in the city. So Bethany, I know you've covered this a lot. You're our legal expert for the day. Can you tell me a little bit about the ins and outs of this case? Sure. Well, obviously, um, the attorneys were just arguing over the residency issue since he had left to go be Obama's chief of staff in 2009. So Rahm's lawyer was arguing that he, he met the residency requirements um, and he used the election code to argue it. And that basically keeps your voting rights if you go away uh, to do business of the United States. And he said the chief of staff position is doing business for the United States. Uh, and then the opponents, they argued that he didn't meet those requirements under the municipal code, which requires you to live there for a year before you can run in a race. And what the appellate court did was say, you have to meet the election code first and then the municipal code. And they said he met the election code so he could vote, but he can't run. Okay. Um, yeah. And he, he did maintain a home there. He continued mm -hmm. to vote there. He did rent out that home. But uh, they feel that he has a pretty strong case of showing that he intended to return to Chicago, that, that, he, that he maintained his residency. Um, as we are taping, a decision has not yet come down from the Supreme Court. We're expecting one probably soon because he did appeal to the court, mm -hmm. but we don't know yet. But um, we talked a little bit about there's some implications for other uh, folks in Chicago because there's a lot of residency requirements in Chicago for different mm -hmm. jobs that might spin out of this case? The opponent's argument is that if the appellate court ruling is allowed to stand and Rahm can't stay on the ballot, is that all the other positions like uh, Chicago police and firefighters, they're required to live in the city as part of their job. So if this ruling stands, they're pretty much saying that it's going to open up kind of the floodgates to allowing you to come up with a, a new argument for residency and potentially a new definition. And that's something that uh, there was a dissenting justice in the appellate court who had a really strong dissent, and uh, she had pointed out that they didn't really, the majority of the appellate court didn't really explain what it meant to reside in an area. So that's still kind of left open. Well, and with this being such a big national story, political issue, those uh, other underlying things that could spin out of this maybe aren't being considered as strongly right now, but the Supreme Court will probably take those into their consideration, do you think? Or? Well, the Supreme Court, when they accepted um, the appeal to the uh, Rahm's appeal, they didn't hear oral arguments or get any new briefs. So they're going off of just the appellate court briefs. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know what goes on yeah. with their considerations, <laughs> but one would assume so. Do you think that uh, they're just taking the previous briefs to expedite the case, basically, because Yes. And the answer needs to come fairly soon. The, the ballots yeah. are going out next week. Yeah, so. one would hope that they have a, a decision before Monday because that's when early voting starts and obviously they need to know whether to put his name on the ballot or not. Ray, you probably know a little bit more about the political implications uh, uh, of this case and, and what may happen if Rahm isn't on the ballot. It opens it up. Yeah, a it's, a, it's a wild case because uh, Rahm, as you had said, is the front runner. So what happens here is if he's taken out of the picture, then you come down to Gary Chico, who was a chief of staff of the, the current Mayor Daley uh, for a few years uh, early in the mayor's term. He served on the Board of Education. He served in various capacities for the mayor. He also uh, would have to face, Chico would then face Miguel Del Valle. Now, a lot of people around here may recognize Miguel because he, he was a senator for a long time here in Springfield, the first Hispanic senator in Illinois. And then if those two candidates stay in, which it looks like they will, then Carol Mosley Braun, the former U.S. senator, also would be in the race and it could be a, a real free-for-all here. Uh, as It makes one recall the time that Carol ran for U.S. Senate and she ran against uh, the sitting senator, Alan Dixon, and Al Holfeld. Holfeld spent a lot of his time beating up on Dixon.
Carol was able to basically split, see them split the vote and she was able to take the remainder and was able to win the race. Now, some people think that that might be a, uh, a forerunner to what could happen here with uh, Chico and Del Valle if Rom is out of the picture. So it's a big, it's a big, big issue here. If Rom does not remain uh, in the race, is anyone emerging as a really clear front runner if he is no longer on the ballot? Or? You know, it's a tough equation because that really throws, he had 44% of the vote, that really throws a lot of the, of the uh, uh, mathematics out the window. And I think a lot of people will be scrambling to figure out then where do they go. It appears that a lot of the establishment uh, Democrats, the kind of uh, old line Democratic machine, the remnants of, of what there is of a machine nowadays, are looking at Chico. And uh, Alderman Ed Burke, who is the Finance Committee Chairman and the most powerful alderman on the council, uh, is in Chico's camp, which of course raises a, another interesting question here. Ann Burke is his wife and she sits on the Illinois Supreme Court. So we've got that other kind of interesting side side scenario going on here too. And it seems she's not going to recuse her, herself from the case, from, from my understanding? No, from the order that was entered when the court said, yes, we're going to agree to hear this, usually at the bottom it'll say, you know, order entered by the court. And if someone doesn't participate, it'll say, you know, Burke took Neil apart. But it just said order entered by the court. And she's come out and has, has, has made a point to say that, you know, just because her husband feels one way doesn't mean she, she feels that way. So she's been strong saying she won't recuse herself. Well, and we talked a little bit earlier in the week, this could have interesting implications for Illinois. A lot of folks went with Obama to D.C. Some of them may want to run for office when they return. Mm -hmm. So they may be watching this decision as well. Um, another big appellate court decision uh, that was a little surprising this week was uh, an appellate court ruled that the state's capital construction uh, program is actually unconstitutional based on the way that the bill was originally drafted. So this puts us in a lot of uh, limbo of what's going to happen with the, with the capital plan. Uh, things are kind of frozen right now. Quinn has appealed it to the Supreme Court. Ray, can you give us a little background on, on um, well, why this happened, what's in the bill? Yeah, I mean, really it comes down to one basic fact. There is a, a line in the Constitution of Illinois that says you can't put a whole bunch of different things together. I'm putting the Joe Lunchbox uh, version out here now, but it says that you cannot violate a single subject rule in legislation. What that means is don't stuff a whole bunch of disparate pieces into one, uh, one bill. And so the court said they did. And they have everything, video gambling, higher liquor taxes, a variety of different things stuffed into, the, into these bills. And they, and they said, well, that's a violation. And because two other bills, three other bills actually said uh, they only go into effect if this bill goes into effect, then four bills were, were knocked out of law as a result, which threw chaos into well, the state. And these bills were all funding mechanisms for this, this uh, huge infrastructure uh, program that we have uh, statewide now, which is, um, is why this is such a body blow to the administration. I mean, this is at the center of Quinn's um, uh, you know, jobs uh, mantra. What surprised me a little bit about this was that was that this really didn't have to happen. I mean, when 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 the legislature and the governor in the past have violated the single subject rule, which they they've done with some regularity, it's usually been because they're they're trying to get something controversial through. They're trying to bring people on board. They're trying to corral people. They're trying to sneak something by. The, the core of this uh, legislation was this hugely popular infrastructure plan. Everybody, uh, for the most part, in both parties wants this thing. Um, they, I, I, all I can guess is that this was a matter of legislative laziness. I'm not really sure why they felt the need to pile this stuff all in. Conversely, I'm not sure this is as, as a huge a tragedy as, um, as everybody's indicating, because even if the Supreme Court doesn't overturn this, you would think that they could get this passed again. I don't know, maybe the, maybe the tone has changed a little, maybe it would be a little more difficult, but it, it seems to me you're going you're to have a hard time voting against what everybody, for the most part, agrees is a jobs bill. Yeah, I think one of the key points there that, that uh, Kevin has already pointed out, and rightly so, is that, the, that the, they have compacted all this into a popular bill 
Now, I think one of, the, one of the elements in that was there may have been some who needed political cover to vote for video gambling, video poker. Now, maybe they'll have to break that out or put it into another package or some separate piece of legislation. If they had a straight up and down vote on that, that could become a bigger campaign issue for some of them down the road. Well, and as Kevin said, this is fairly standard practice. I mean, it doesn't happen constantly, but it, it happens uh, fairly often. And uh, Bethany, you talked to me a little bit about uh, some other times that, that this has been called into question, mm -hmm. that it's been taken to the Supreme Court. There's there's some legal precedent here as far as cases. Oh, definitely. I know there's there's several. Um, the, uh, going both ways too. Like I know there was one, uh, a budget bill that had, they amended like 20 different statutes, but they said it didn't violate it because it all dealt with budget stuff. And while that's, you know, a big vague term, they said, I mean, the court, the way they look at it, the court says it has to have like a natural and logical connection to each other. So they said, since they were all budget related, it made sense. But there was another instance where it was, what was it, like the sexual, um, Predators list or something like that, and they combined it with like a hospital. Yeah, thing. there was a, that was a really weird one. I, I don't remember that, and, and they really had nothing to do with each other. Yes. And I remember hearing an explanation. I can't remember what it was now, but it made me laugh out loud. The <laughs> explanation of how it was connected. Yeah. But and the they, idea they was that no one would be able to vote against. I'm assuming the bill that related to sexual right. predators. Yes. Sure. So they snuck in this this hospital right. issue. But the court said it. there was no natural, you know, con or logical connection between the two. So they said it did violate the single subject rule. Well, it's interesting that they let the the budget thing slide because on this case the main issue is that the topic is revenue and it said uh, in the opinion well you could basically put anything that that affects the state's economy mm -hmm. under a revenue bill mm -hmm. and you know it, it's it's sort of circumventing the the rule in the first place so mm -hmm. um, well I guess we shall see how it proceeds uh, we don't know if the Supreme Court has chosen to take it yet Correct. Not yet. They not that I know of. I know they put in the the leave for a stay on it, but I hadn't heard yet as of today. And Ray, I think you made a good point on on, on the video poker of what could possibly happen with that. Uh, it's stalled out basically now the implementation right. of, yeah, of the video poker. Right, right, and that that's another reason that it could be, you know, a concern. Well, some people may say, well, we haven't used it anyway. Why don't we find another revenue stream to back these construction projects and forget about all this video poker nonsense, as somebody might say. And then that gets complicated, too, because we just passed a, a sizable income tax right. increase in this state, which wasn't in place when they originally passed all this. At this point, there might be people who say, well, I can't go back to my constituents after we've imposed this new tax and say, oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to vote for some more stuff, too. And here, let me explain to you why this is okay. No, they're not. They're going to stop right there and not listen any further. Yeah, and if you want to take a drink about this, it's going to cost you more, <laughs> yeah. too. Even if it's going to cost your wallet for the income tax, you won't be able to buy your booze. It's well, terrible. and it seems that that was some of the reason for the lawsuit in the first place, correct? Because uh, a, a liquor distributor. Yes, yeah. because huh. the bill also raises the taxes on, on alcohol, soft yeah. drinks, some hygiene products, candy. Andy, and a, Ray, can you yeah. tell us a little bit about the, the guy that brought this well, lawsuit forward? Well, it's a gamut, and, and uh, the suit was brought by a fellow named Rocky Wirtz, who is not only the owner of the Chicago Blackhawks hockey team, but he also is a major liquor baron in Illinois. He's a distributor, and uh, their big complaint was that the the uh, amount of taxes, the hike in taxes, if you will, on wine and hard liquor like Jack Daniels or something like that um, is disproportionate to the hike <coughs> in, in beer. So they said it was unfair. They complained about the fairness of that and they complained about the single subject rule. The courts, as we just talked about, grabbed onto that single subject rule and said, hey, you know, something's got to be done. Well, and I remember when they were drafting this, they did tweak those levels a little bit, so I could see where you might be able to find some complaint in, in there being a disparity because those did change a little um, as the as the process was going on as far as what they were discussing. They're still um, staying in place, too, uh, and uh, they're going to stay as long as they try to figure out whether the stay <laughs> they're going to stay if the stays in place. <laughs> they won't stay if the stay isn't in place, if you follow what I'm saying. But basically, the court can put that ruling on hold, and uh, they call that a stay, and therefore uh, the 
Quinn administration is pretty confident they'll get the stay and they also are fairly confident that they can win this battle. Whether they do or not, it'll be up to the legislature to straighten out one way or another. Yeah, the Quinn administration has asked the Supreme Court to kind of hold off on implementing any of these, any, any of these uh, things that were in the appellate decision uh, until they decide whether or not they're going to take the case and they rule because it, it would it would be a little difficult to stop collecting the taxes, stop right. the, the construction projects. Well, that, that's, and that's part of the problem. This money is already being spent as we speak, right. so you're, you're, you're really on the hot seat. And if somebody suddenly says, oh, by the way, the funding mechanism is illegal and we're going to pull it away from you. Right. <laughs> well, you know, this also affects like license plate fees, mm -hmm. uh, driver's license fees, right. title transfers, things like that. It's a broad, uh, broad uh, new law, so we'll see. There's a lot of things in it. That's part right. of the reason why there was the complaint, for sure. Um, <laughs> looking at bonding, too, we've already we've already done some bonding. Uh, we've done some borrowing based on this, uh, based right? on this mm -hmm. revenue, basically saying, hey, let us borrow this money so we can build and we'll pay you back with the money that pays off from these taxes and other mechanisms in the future. Uh, we are set to do more borrowing. I assume we may not go through with that yet. Uh, I would think the capital mark bond markets would be a little hesitant to uh, that give the us funding a great, source has been a great in illegal? interest yeah. rate <laughs> <laughs> since we are the state's not sure if they have a, a, way, Twitter, a yeah. way to pay it back right yeah. now. So, yeah. so it just there's so many things that come into play with this issue that uh, it, it could potentially throw out of whack, and it's going to be a big mess and well, an interesting I, thing for them to clean it, up it if is, they and have I noticed to. The governor's first uh, reaction to this, his, his, his initial, at least the statement that he put out to the media was talking all about how many jobs this program has created, which obviously is not a legal argument. It, um, it kind of makes you wonder if they're going to try and take an end justifies the means argument to this because that doesn't right. usually sit well with the courts. <laughs> yeah. True. Um, well, we've started into the next legislative session. Uh, the legislature is returning next week, and some new bills are starting to be introduced. Starting to, in a normal two-year session, we'll get six or 7,000 bills just in the House alone. Uh, my, my count of the House bills this morning was 275 uh, filed so far, and that's uh, not too bad for, what, two weeks out or however far we are. <laughs> uh, a lot of these are about uh, concealed carry or other gun-related issues. Uh, it seems to be maybe one of the big things that's going to be coming up uh, this session. There's been a couple of Supreme Court, U U.S. Supreme Court cases in the last two years which um, gun uh, advocates believe will help their cause in terms of uh, uh, allowing concealed carry in Illinois, which is one of the few states that doesn't have it. And those cases that were both, uh, they both applied to specific cities. One was, one was D.C. and then there was a follow-up case in, in uh, Chicago, which uh, established that this wasn't just on federal territory but individual cities. And essentially what it said is um, that, that there is to some degree a Second Amendment right to bear arms and that, that a local municipality can only go so far in, in restricting that. That's what these uh, pieces of legislation, for the most part, are, are, are latched onto. They're essentially saying um, state law determines what gun laws are. You can't do it locally, which I find a little ironic because these are mostly social conservatives doing this, and in most cases, they're the first ones to tell you, hey, no centralized government. We want local communities doing this stuff. They want the opposite in this case. Well, in, in the in the Chicago ruling, uh, hand, handguns were banned in Chicago. The Supreme Court uh, overturned that ban. But then the Chicago ordinance that came out after that was very, very specific of where you can have a gun, mm -hmm. very specific on what requirements you had to have to own a gun. You couldn't take it out of your home. Right. So. I guess I'm not understanding how, how they're going to base some of those. Well, it's going, to be, it's going to be a game of inches. I mean, the Supreme Court didn't say, didn't come out and say you can't have gun laws. What they said is uh, that, that, they, that there are, are lines beyond which you can't go. And I'm, I'm not going to pretend that, I, that I'm fully versed in the whole, in the whole decision. But um, it's interesting, some of the legislation that's been filed is, is not even talking about concealed carry. It's talking about just the general principle that a city's gun laws cannot supersede state law. Now, no, normally right now they can. I mean, you have, you have home rural cities and you have local ordinances that can be stricter than you have in the state level. That's what they're trying to get at first. It's almost a two-part strategy. So we get at that first, and then we pass a concealed carry law statewide, which Chicago's ordinance cannot come along and, and supersede because we have this other law in the books. So Chicago could go from no handguns to concealed carry, Walking around in your belt, yeah, conceivably. Yeah. That's, that's, well. that's the goal. Um, 
looking at another thing that's been introduced recently that uh, is making news and a lot of Republicans are jumping on board is a repeal of the income yeah. tax increase that just passed. That, that took all of about <laughs> four days, yeah, before they filed that one. It, um, we blogged on this uh, at the Post-Dispatch and when we caught a little heat from our readers because they thought that our, our, our tone was too skeptical and a little snarky maybe a little snarky maybe <laughs> I, I i think you know we have an obligation to be honest with readers that this is not something that's ever going to be called for a vote um this is obviously uh you know the republicans making a statement and you can I, I think legitimately say that that's a fine and legitimate statement to make but there's not much chance that the house or the senate is going to be voting on this again this year Ray, what's your take on this repeal bill? Do, do you think it's kind of a, a, a political maneuver? Or? Yeah, it's somebody who wants to say, hey, we shouldn't be raising taxes. And, you well, know, taxes. yeah, that's right. Everybody everybody in the legislature would we like that. Co sponsors. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it, it might get 177 co sponsors, <laughs> but no vote. I, no, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it took forever to get to get the income tax through. They finally put it through with uh, multiple lame ducks in place, right. uh, voting for it in the waning hours. I mean, the, literally in the waning hours of the session. I just don't see that uh, two Democratic leaders uh, in the House and Senate are going to allow that to have a floor vote. Do you think um, Kulich and Senate President John Kulich has been, been a little bit more open to calling things, at least in committee? Do you think there's a chance he may call it in committee just to kind of shoot it down and well, yeah, make sure. a point? Sure, they could do that. I mean, they could, uh, they could uh, it'll go in, in uh, rules, their assignments committee, and that'll be a, a small room, <laughs> public meeting that you can crawl into sometimes if you breathe in. But uh, also it could get to the executive committee too. And, uh, you know, they have all the people who are leaders and can take the tough votes and they could they could kill it there and say look we just got in doing a, a tax increase this is the policy of the land everything's based on that we can't roll it back right now well um that's it for this week we will be tracking all the, well not all of those new bills but a lot of them uh, <laughs> each week on the show i would like to thank uh, kevin mcdermott bethany Crigellis, and ray long for joining me today i'm your host jamie dunn thank you for tuning in to capital view Thank you.